Hello, I'm Judd Danby, and I join us all here at Purdue Convocations in being thrilled to welcome back to the stage on November 9th, 2023, our old musical friends, the Kronos Quartet. Kronos Quartet has been here a number of times over the years, always with uh, exciting new programs uh, filled with many brand new pieces. And November 9th's program will be no different in that regard. But it is a special season for Kronos because they were founded 50 years ago by violinist David Harrington. And in the 50 years since, they have consistently been at the forefront of commissioning new works and expanding the repertory of the string quartet in very exciting ways. And I always think of the Kronos Quartet in the present and future tenses. They seem to be very much about the now and what's coming next. But because this is a milestone season, um, it seemed to invite for me a bit of reflection and a bit of a backward glance. I was able to sit down recently with David Harrington and have a pretty lengthy conversation about the origins and history of the Kronos Quartet um, but also about what we'll be hearing here on November 9th. And we've captured it all to share with you in three pre-show videos uh, aimed at helping our, uh, all of our friends here at Purdue Convos get just a little bit more perhaps out of their concert experience by being able to uh, listen to the, you know, the founder of the group talk about uh, so much of what has driven their music making over the past five decades. We'll split this into uh, three parts, um, most of which will be my conversation with David Harrington, but along the way we'll intersperse some recorded excerpts from Kronos's rich 50-year discography of over 70 recordings, which is remarkable. This first video focuses uh, on the deep roots, not just of Kronos Quartet, but really of the string quartet as a medium, as a fixed instrumental ensemble, uh, dating back to its, its emergence in the 18th century and the rich repertory initially composed by Haydn, uh, followed shortly by Mozart, Beethoven, Schubert, and on through um, the 19th 20th and into the 21st centuries. And it's, a, it's a, almost a musical genre that's drawn out of so many composers, some of their richest and most exploratory musical thinking. Um, and I was very curious in talking with David because this is not um, repertory that, that Kronos performs live or records. So I really wanted to know what was the relationship, his relationship and the quartet's relationship to that founding body and that, that older um, body of literature that so deeply informs this music um, and, and against which in a way Kronos has set itself uh, in, in its response to. And he speaks about this in fascinating ways. Well, David, we are so thrilled to have you and Kronos Quartet uh, here with us uh, actually again. Uh, we'll talk a little later about how you've been here before, um, but what, a, what, what an exciting uh, addition to our concert season at Purdue Convos. So, uh, and we're thrilled to be able to talk with you ahead of time and get some extra insights into your music and the, the sort of forces at play behind your music making. Uh, and interests. So <clears throat> speaking of interests, uh, I read your um, biographical comments about an early experience, I think it was age 12, hearing Beethoven's Opus 127 quartet in E flat major, and being so taken with the sound of that, that it gave you this, this sort of uh, musical epiphany. I'd love to hear you say a little something about that. Well, those opening E flat major chords became instantly something that I had to learn how to make myself. Mm -hmm. And that's the first time I ever heard a string quartet. 
Oh my, nice. And uh, what I did is I went to the Seattle Public Library and checked out the music and called up three friends who were also in the Seattle Youth Symphony. And we got together and we tried to play that piece. And for, you know, maybe a tenth of a second, it sounded like the record. <laughs> <laughs> and what I've realized ever since that moment is that tenths of seconds are very important. Yeah. The, um, you know, the, the kernel of, of belief that, that I could do something happened instantly because I heard it. <laughs> but there's also a way you're you're sort of inside it because you're actually making it with colleagues i'm imagining right i've had that experience as a performer yeah yeah absolutely and you're making it together and and you hear it and and even if you know after that tenth of a second it sounds terrible you still have that tenth of a second and, <laughs> and you hold to that and that becomes the root system and for me it's it's still there. The that, you know, the the uh, knowledge that if I hear something that grabs me and magnetizes me, I have to find a way to bring it into the world of Kronos, and I've done that uh, well for the last fifty years of Kronos. But even before that, as as a as a kid, um, that's how I discovered new pieces. That's how I. Uh, learned more about the world. Marvelous. So, you know, for those of us who have, uh, who know Kronos Quartet and have followed you to any length uh, or to any degree over the 50 years, um, we probably don't associate Beethoven with Kronos Quartet. Uh, and I've been sort of curious, it's almost a silly question, but um, though it's not music of Papa Haydn, you know, Mozart, Beethoven, the, 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 the standard core repertory um, may not be part of your, your live performance repertory. Are there ever moments where you just get together and jam on some Beethoven with the group? You know, we have not done that, but I can tell you for sure that everybody that does anything like what I do or Kronos does, we all have our inner Haydn. <laughs> Interesting. And the inner Haydn is, for me, is um, alive and well. And every time we do something uh, that feels like it's kind of a new addition to the world of the string quartet, my inner Haydn smiles. <laughs> we just did we just did a premiere on on uh, Sunday uh, music of Alexander Vrabelov and I had the biggest Haydn inner smile I've had in years and uh, uh, you know I, I I think the the you know getting back to root systems the root system of the string quartet the Haydn's, Mozart's, Beethoven's, Schubert's. That is one of the most magnificent root systems that any art form has ever had. And what Kronos has wanted to do is keep that plant alive and growing and reflecting the world that we're all a part of. But, uh, um, you know, because we don't play those early founders of the string quartet medium does not mean we don't appreciate them every minute of, of course yeah. Yeah, yeah and and it's interesting you bring up uh roots uh i, I a couple of years ago i undertook a project at my house to um put in a mixed almost entirely native garden mm -hmm. and i in the couple of years since i've been really just spending time watching it and and reflecting on it it actually worked its way into a into a piece I was working on about a year ago and it occurred to me that um the the soil that that we're planted in uh is really 
a, a kind of an organic influence. We think of influence also often as something more kind of social and direct, maybe even a, a bit of a power relationship. But I started thinking about, you know, like things like hydrangeas whose flower color is different depending on the soil they happen to be rooted in. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I, I really do love that kind of organic um, analogy that you bring in. Yeah, I mean, for, for me, mu music is is so much a result of people and our interactions, not only with each other but with the world and the uh, the the friction that exists between us and the world. Hmm results i believe in music and and uh, it, it's something that is um worldwide you know people share it every minute of the day and and also it's totally mysterious like how does it really work you know <laughs> and when you think about it how does it work i have to tell you i do not know <laughs> I, spend, <laughs> I, I spend all my time thinking about it and um, putting programs together and recordings and, and musical experiences of all sorts. But if I had to define it, I cannot really define it. It, it slips through the hands. It, it goes into your ears and then it disappears. It's, you know, I'm becoming a poet and I know it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, now you've given me this this wonderful image of, I don't know if it's, you know, the world is a string and we're the bow or vice versa, but this, this sort of friction between us that winds up creating these vibrations. I love it. 